Alexander Demesli is a senior advisor for chemistry, toxicology, and related sciences at the USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service, otherwise known as FSIS. In this role, he leads the agency on scientific policy and regulatory issues related to veterinary drugs, pesticides, and chemical contaminants in meat, poultry, and egg products. Mr. Dumesli has worked for the USDA since 2010, serving as a risk assessor for pesticides and other chemical hazards in food. He was also temporarily detailed to the White House Council on Environmental Quality as senior advisor for natural resources between 2017 and 2019. So Dr. Mr. Dumesli has a, a law degree uh, with the highest honors from the GW School of Law. He has a master's in uh, environmental health from University of Washington, Seattle, and a BS in chemistry also from the University of Washington, Seattle. So Alexander, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you very much, uh, Neil uh, and, and Ilse for this, uh, for this invitation. Um, so I'm, I would like to, uh, shift the, the the focus a little bit from the um, the the scientific research to the um, the 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 practical um, regulatory aspects that that we deal with um, in a regulatory agency. So it'll be a little bit of a um, shift in focus. Just briefly as an overview for those who are not familiar with uh, the Food Safety and Inspection Service, it's the an agency within the Department of Agriculture, and uh, we are responsible for, um, we're a public health regulatory agency responsible for meats, poultry, and um, processed egg products. And what always trips people up, the definition of meat in our case includes uh, catfish, also known as soliriforms, and we'll speak a little bit about that later, um, but then also, of course, beef, uh, poultry, pork, lamb, uh, things like that. So the, the experience that we've had uh, with PFAS over the, over the last uh, several years um, has mostly been, uh, uh, for our agency, not so much on the food packaging side, but more on the um, uh, kind of environmental exposures to food producing animals. So um, specifically, that's been and that ties in well with the previous presentation that's been both through agricultural agricultural water applied um, either directly to the animals or to uh, feed crops, as well as the um, bio sludge pathway that was uh, discussed when um, industrial contamination is, is concentrated in wastewater treatment plants. And then the sludge from there may be spread on fields. So to, to my knowledge, um, We've responded to kind of individual PFAS situations, uh, not a, by no means on a regular basis, but um, the the furthest back that that I'm aware of was back in 2008, um, a bio sludge application uh, situation where uh, animals were grazing on those fields. Um, uh, this was in, uh, in in Alabama, and the the agency had to make a determination as to the the safety of of those animals so those were kind of individualized situations um, i will say the current effort over the last a couple of years has been much um, broader and government-wide so there's there's really been a focus um, among uh, regulatory and public health agencies to to work together to um, kind of respond in in concert to um, the pfas for us specifically at USDA and, and even more specifically at the Food Safety Inspection Service, our PFAS related activities really uh, fall along three main lines. Uh, and I'm gonna briefly talk about all three of those in this presentation. So the first has been uh, in the laboratory, we've developed analytical methods for detecting PFAS in food products. Um, to in a variety to cover a variety of um, PFAS compounds as well as a variety of um, matrices uh, so tissues from from animals that we regulate. Then uh, we've also used those analytical methods to uh, initiate some exploratory testing of um, meat samples uh, under the larger umbrella of our um, chemical surveillance program, which is known as the National Residue Program. 
And then finally, the third line has been um, supporting producers and state governments uh, when when they are dealing with uh, with a specific PFAS contamination. Um, so we've done a, a bit of that over the last couple of years. And in all cases, we work closely with with our federal partners, uh, uh, particularly FDA and EPA. So the first um, the first area uh, that I mentioned is the laboratory work. Uh, just for background, for those who are not aware, uh, the agency does operate three full service laboratories um, uh, with quality assurance and emergency response staff, and they're spread across the country in uh, Georgia, Missouri, and California. Uh, every day, these laboratories receive uh, numerous tissue samples from slaughter processing and import establishment across the country, and uh, they conduct a full suite of tests for um, a variety of hazards, including my microbial pathogens, um, and then uh, chemical residues that, that fall into three different bins there, pesticides, veterinary drugs, and uh, chemical contaminants. There's also um, pathological testing if, uh, if, if animals that, are, that appear diseased can be uh, further evaluated. So the, these labs are, they're both kind of high, high throughput regulatory labs that, uh, that, that test samples, but they also, um, you know, we also develop our own uh, methods. Uh, so we don't do research per se, but we do certainly do method development and implementation. Just to give you an idea of the scale, in the last fiscal year, the labs analyzed more than 100,000 samples, so that's 100,000 physical uh, pieces of, uh, of, of meat, poultry, egg products, and performed more than half a million tests on those samples with um, uh, more than 2.65 million results being reported. So the, the method that was developed um, uh, about about two years ago, year and a half ago, um, is uh, currently validated for bovine muscle and plasma. So we'll talk about the blood plasma a little bit later, um, but but that's the, the the current scope. It is we're close to completing an extension of that method also to uh, porcine poultry and um, the aforementioned siliriformes um, muscle tissues, uh, which which will be put into place um, pretty much as we speak. I'm not an analytical chemist, so I do have some slides in here about the specific method that our, our labs developed. Um, I'm happy to, to take questions on those and pass them along to the uh, experts, but for the, uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I think the, the, key, uh, the key aspects are that the method uh, does include Often known as the the Alex, I believe you're you're cutting off. We've lost your audio. compounds and so this is is certainly um, just a start but it it does include um, some of the the individual compounds that have uh, you know been, been are known as uh, as causing environmental exposure so we've got PFOS PFOA um, PFHXS um, and, and others in the, in the method this is a little bit more on the um, equipment that's used for the method um, I give some uh, statistics about the, uh, it takes about 14 minutes per injection and the region costs of about $3 per sample. For uh, more information on the method, obviously, as I said, you can, uh, you can ask uh, me or the, uh, the website there does um, link, uh, or that link does um, have our chemistry laboratory guidebook, which uh, we make all our methods public. So there's um, more information available there on the um, on the PFAS method as well. Excuse me. 
<clears throat> so we'll move on now to the second um, line of, uh, uh, of, of work that we've been doing, and that's been the surveillance testing under the umbrella of the National Residue Program. So uh, the National Residue Program in general provides kind of a, a, a structured process for identifying, evaluating, and responding to chemical compounds of concern in, in food animals. And when we say concern, we really mean both public health, that's, that's our, our central mission, um, but the National Residue Program also exists um, uh, to, uh, to further compliance with drug and pesticide use regulations. So we don't actually regulate those, those chemicals, they're regulated by FDA and EPA respectively, but we work closely with those agencies to design a program that not only protects public health, but also um, will uh, kind of signal if um, there's uh, misuse, uh, widespread misuse of, of, of any of those types of chemicals, or um, if uh, you know, the, the assessments underlying the approval of those chemicals may, may need to be updated. So we collect data on, uh, on, chem on those kind of three broad categories of chemical compounds that I mentioned earlier. And uh, uh, it's, it's both a data collection effort, but it, there's also regulatory follow-up, um, again, in coordination with our partner agencies when we do detect um, high uh, levels of, of chemicals, which doesn't happen very often, but, um, but it does and, and, and action is taken. Um, in those cases. So the current testing for PFAS specifically is exploratory in nature. And what we mean by that, um, that uh, when I said in the previous slide, we kind of do data collection, but then we also um, kind of have specific uh, follow-up regulatory actions that, that result from, from individual test results. In this case with the PFAS, we're more in the data collection phase. Um, now that can change over time, but but right now this is a, a, a new method, a new um, for us, uh, uh, and, and we are trying to gather data to inform kind of agency policies and actions going forward. Uh, it's also a result of the fact that there is no currently no kind of quantitative regulatory level for any of the PFAS compounds in uh, meat and poultry. But having said that, we do have a general statutory responsibility to ensure that the product that we are inspecting is, is safe. So if we were to find um, high levels, that would certainly lead to uh, you know, accelerating a, a regulatory response. But for now, the focus, as I mentioned, is on surveillance of the food supply as a whole rather than individual enforcement. And this is an overview of the testing we've done over the past um, year or so. Uh, so we've tested more than 1,100 um, bovine muscle samples um, since uh, since starting last October, and um, the the samples were. Uh, this goes a little bit into the detail of our sampling program, but we have both uh, under the umbrella of this national residue program, we both take kind of randomized samples uh, as well as what we call inspector generated samples that are animals that have been. Um, identified as, as potentially having a pathology or, or having uh, you know, injection sites that, that may point to, to, to drug use. Um, uh, and, and so those are animals that are sampled for testing by the USDA inspectors in the slaughter establishment. So for this PFAS testing, we're actually using um, those inspector generated samples for uh, a, a number of reasons um, related to, to just having access to a lot of um, primarily beef samples um, and it is kind of a sort of convenient sample. Now we don't have any reason to believe that this since they're being sampled for reasons that are totally unrelated to PFAS exposure um, we have no reason to believe that that would kind of skew the results um, but uh, going forward we may also discuss integrating PFAS testing into our kind of randomized testing as well. Um, but for now, this is the sample we have and the sample that we tested. Like I said, um, 1,100 in total, mostly, uh, I, I'm not sure of the exact breakdown, but I think at least half were dairy cow samples, and then the other half were kind of a mixture of different beef production classes. Um, and out of those 1,100, only four tested positive, 
all below one parts per billion and all for PFOS, P-F-O-S, um, and no positive detected for any other PFAS compounds. So the next steps for PFAS testing under the National Residue Program um, is to continue the, the, the beef testing, uh, at least for another fiscal year, and then also to uh, add additional species to the testing. As I mentioned at the outset, we've uh, our, our method validation is uh, pretty much complete in that regard. So the plan is to start testing swine, chicken, and um, catfish beginning this fall. And um, the objective for now remains the same, understanding the potential presence of PFAS in the food supply as a whole. And by food supply as a whole, I mean the, the uh, USDA regulated food supply as a whole. So once that data has been um, collected or as it's being collected, we're gonna monitor it in, in real time. Um, we'll certainly have discussions internally and with our partners uh, about potential um, uh, actions that, that may need to be taken. So that brings me to the third area, which has been the uh, interactions we've had um, with state regulatory agencies as well as uh, individual producers. So over the, the last uh, 10 or more years, that has uh, occurred on occasion. I mentioned that, that situation back in 2008 um, in Alabama. And over the last couple of years with the, the, the raised, I think, awareness around uh, PFAS, the increased environmental uh, testing for PFAS, um, there's been kind of a few, we've had a few more conversations over the last couple of years than perhaps we've had in, in the previous um, years before that. The most significant interaction today, which I'll kind of use as an example um, uh, and give a little more detail about, involved a large dairy in the southwestern United States that had four to 5,000 animals that were uh, supplied with, uh, with water, drinking water that was contaminated with PFOS. Um, this was in um, likely, uh, the, the aquifer was likely um, uh, contaminated related to uh, firefighting foam. This was near an Air Force base. And, um, and, and that's the situation that we became aware of in, in, in 2018 um, and have been working closely with, with FDA, uh, the state government, EPA, and even the dairy owner uh, directly, which, which is not our regulated industry is really the, uh, the meat producers, the slaughter establishments, the processors, um, but you know, on occasion, we'll also work with uh, with producers directly. So when this uh, when the agency became aware of this situation, milk from the dairy was prevented from entering commerce, and uh, therefore the the focus kind of shifted. Well, can these animals be uh, safely slaughtered for meat? And um, the agency kind of put a hold on that and said, well, we got to do some some testing and analysis first. So last, early last year, uh, in March of 2019, we, uh, by then we had developed this, uh, this testing method that, that I mentioned. So we had the capability to test um, uh, these animals and, and a lot of that work was actually done in cooperation with the, the USDA Agricultural Research Service. So I wanna be sure and give credit to, to ARS as well. Um, they actually purchased uh, a, a number of animals from the dairy, uh, slaughtered some of them, took a bunch of different tissue samples, um, um, uh, all the various organs, skin, um, urine, feces, milk, um, I think whatever, you know, whatever they could sample, they pretty much sampled. Um, and then some of the animals they, uh, they actually kept alive, moved them to a, um, to uh, away from the dairy, so where they were um, on, on clean water and uh, took regular blood samples to see if a kind of depletion curve could be, um, could be established. So on a side note, a lot of that, um, uh, a lot of the data has been analyzed. A lot of it has not yet been analyzed. Um, ARS is, uh, is taking the lead on that, but, but certainly those will be some, um, I think publications to, to be on the lookout for down the road um, as they're, they're, they're working through that. 
so while that work was going on, we were also working together with um, with FDA on the more uh, regulatory policy side to develop an interim screening level for PFOS. Now that's not an action level or regulatory level, enforceable level or anything like that, but assembly level that we could use internally to um, provide some context to our testing results and to develop kind of a mitigation proposal around see if is there a path forward where we can um, where these animals can be removed from the exposure um, and uh, uh, potentially be monitored as the uh, the PFOS levels deplete. So then earlier this year, um, we were informed that the animals had been moved to clean water um, shortly after or about six to eight weeks after we were able to take some blood samples from a subset of those animals. Um, but even though we had a, a, a depletion curve based on the, the animals that we purchased back in 2019, and that depletion curve suggested that we would see some decreases in PFOS levels in the, in the blood plasma, uh, they actually turned out to be quite similar. Uh, the, the animals that were sampled in um, March of 2020 actually had some very similar levels to the um, animals that were sampled in 2019, even though the animals that were sampled in 2020 were moved to clean water for um, for several, for about close to two months. Um, so that was interesting. I mean, we don't know exactly. It could have been that between the 2019 sampling and the 2020 sampling, they actually increased their PFOS levels and they were depleting, um, but had just kind of, we caught them on the, the other side of that curve. Um, or maybe there's something else going on. So we uh, left the animals where they were for uh, a few more months and sampled again in um, July. And again, kind of the same result. Um, so there's that I think is an example of um, some of the, the the difficulties going on with uh, with uh, with kind of a persistent and, and ubiquitous chemical like this. I mean, there's any number of explanations. There could be another source of PFOS besides the water, um, feed, um, soil, the water, you know, maybe we were told they were moved to clean water. Maybe this clean water wasn't really clean, although there was some sampling done by other agencies on that too. So that's um, not super likely. Or, you know, the depletion is not occurring as expected. So at this point, um, that's kind of the end of the story. It's still a little bit in a holding pattern. Um, USDA is uh, in, dis in discussions at, a, at a, essentially the secretary's level to determine um, what, what the agency can do to kind of help um, uh, dispose of these animals if that's ultimately the, the, the decision that's made. But um, um, the kind of mitigation proposal where they could go to slaughter was, you know, was contingent on these PFAS levels coming down. So that's, uh, that's not going to be an option.